Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. This is what God's Word says. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. The Hallelujah Chorus is from a big work by Handel. It's called The Messiah. Many of you have probably heard it or are familiar with it. Hallelujah Chorus is maybe the most famous part of The Messiah. And the Hallelujah Chorus is based off three verses from Revelation. One of them is Revelation 19.6. And that's on the screen here. It says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like the loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Hallelujah is repeated often in the Hallelujah chorus. That is one of the verses. Another one is Revelation 19.16. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the third verse that it's based on is the one that we just read. 11.15 The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And so these passages here, these talk about how Christ is our King. He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords. We don't always recognize Him as our King. We often live lives as if we were kings of our own lives, our own domains. But Christ is King. We may not always see it, we may not always acknowledge it, but Christ is our King. Look at the screen here with me and let's say this together. Why the next words in the Apostles' Creed and is seated at the right hand of God. Christ ascended to heaven there to show that he is head of his church and that the Father rules all things through him. So he is head of his church. We acknowledge him as our Lord. But more than that, the Father rules all things through him. And that's not just in the future, that's Now, even now, Christ is king. So right now, Christ rules over all, but not all acknowledge him. There's many people in this world that we are familiar with, and they don't recognize Jesus as their king at all. I mean, we we might recognize Jesus as our king in in perfect ways, but there's some who just don't recognize Jesus as their king at all. He's, he was maybe some guy who lived a long time ago and maybe he had a religious following, and, but that's, that's, yeah, he was just some guy a long time ago. He's not the son of God or anything. Many people would say that. It says in Hebrews 2 verse 8, In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. In other words, everything is subject to Christ. But then it goes on, it says, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. We don't see it. Even though he does rule, he rules from heaven, we don't see it. We see a lot of sin, a lot of trouble, a lot of problems, a lot of disorientation in this world. And so we don't see the reign of God. 
He is reigning, but we don't always see it. Many people reject him, and even we ourselves will reject him at times too. This world resists God's rule. And part of our hearts, we kind of resist God's rule too. We, we, have, we have sin that lingers within us and we just we resist at times. You know, we, we want our own life. We want to do it our way. We don't really want to listen to all of God's commandments. And, and God has shown us grace, so maybe, maybe we can get away with this. some sins here and there. You know, maybe that's okay. And, you know, this is how we think. We resist God's rule. The world resists God's rule. It says in verse 18 that the nations were angry. In the Psalms it says, Lord, why do the nations rage and the kingdoms plot in vain against the king that you have installed? And this is foreshadowing to this verse here. But if you look at this passage, I like how it says the kingdoms of the world, or the kingdom of the world, has become the kingdom of our Lord. So the world's kingdoms are now the kingdoms of the Lord. One day the world's kingdoms will acknowledge their true ruler. Like last week in the passage that we looked at, at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, every knee. People who have denied Jesus their whole life don't believe in God at all. The most hardened atheists in the whole world, when they see Jesus coming again, they are not going to be able to help but to have those knees hit the ground. Every knee will bow. And the kingdoms of this world that resist Christ now will one day bow before Him and say, You are our King. Christ is King. In Daniel, I like how he prophesies about this kingdom. It says, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all of those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. That is the kingdom of Christ. It's going to crush all of these kingdoms that are here now, including the United States of America. And it will set up his own kingdom. And the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord. And all things will be made right. All things will be made right. That is why Christ is the Prince of Peace. Because when he finally rules... There will be peace on earth like we've never known before. And that's the wonderful gospel message. Christ will bring peace to this world and all the things that trouble us now will be gone. The Hallelujah Chorus celebrates this. George Handel, he was, he was a born musician. He was born to be a musician. There's a picture of him there. It says, Mozart actually said about him, Handel knows better than any of us what will make an effect. When he chooses, he strikes like a thunderbolt. That was Mozart. He didn't give away compliments very easily. And Ludwig von Beethoven even said, mentioning the Messiah, he said that Handel was the greatest composer that ever lived. So this is Handel. At age 12, he was substituting for his organ teacher and had written his first composition. At 18, he composed his first opera. In the next five years, as a musician, he was a composer and conductor at courts and churches in Rome, Florence, Naples, Venice, Germany, and England, where he would move and permanently stay. But he was also a very devout Christian man. This is one of his friends said this about him. Throughout his life, he manifested a deep sense of religion. In conversation, he would frequently declare the pleasure he felt in setting the scriptures to music and how contemplating the many sublime passages in the Psalms had contributed to his edification. So he even talked about his faith a lot and how the scriptures built him up. 
So he had a pretty successful career, but there was one point there where his life and his career took a dive. Opera was kind of his thing, and it was going out of style in England. There were increasingly elaborate opera productions, and there were more and more costs due to them, and fewer and fewer people who were attending them. There was one performance that was his where two leading sopranos on stage came to blows, and the audience cheered them on in their fighting. In April of 1737, at age 52, he seems to have suffered from a stroke. He had his right arm paralyzed, and his vision was blurred. It was impossible for him to perform or conduct. So he lost his fortune in the opera business. He was depressed, he was in debt, and so he gave up the business. He was bankrupt, he was in great physical pain. There were even plots to sabotage him. And the once great opera composer, he scheduled one last farewell appearance in London. And to the London elite, it looked like if this German nincompoop, as he was once called, was through. So people thought that he was at his end. Threatened with debtor's prison, he was asked to write for a benefit concert to help those in debtor's prison. And so he had that last performance, and then he was asked to write for a benefit concert for people in debtor's prison. And so he decided to do it. He was given some funding by a group of charities in Dublin. He had to go all the way to Dublin to find some work. And so he went to compose a new work as that benefit concert. At the same time, there was a friend who gave him a libretto of scripture in need of music. And his name, this friend of was his was named Charles Jennings. He was a devout Christian man, and he was very concerned about the rise of deism in England, people who were influenced by the Enlightenment. So he had this set of scriptures that he thought, this is going to be helpful. This is going to bring people back to who Jesus is. So he brought this libretto to his friend George Handel and proposed that it form the basis of an oratorio intended for a secular audience around the time of Easter. So Handel decided to take on that project. He wrote Messiah at the low point of his life. And he wrote it in an extraordinary pace. He wrote 260 pages of music in just 24 days. People are still wondering to this day how he accomplished that. Just 24 days he wrote that many pages. There's about a quarter of a million notes in the Messiah. And at a little more than three weeks of 10-hour days, there's one guy who said that means that he would have to write 15 notes a minute for 10 hours every day. No breaks. And his servants, while he was writing this, would often find him in tears as he was composing When he completed the Hallelujah Chorus, he reportedly told his servant, I did think I saw heaven open and I saw the very face of God. The Messiah was all scriptural, it was all about Christ, and it was written to help others. The note on his original manuscript read, To God alone be the glory. The Messiah was directed at people who came to a theater rather than a church during the week of Easter to bring them to the true meaning of that season, that holiday. Its first performance was in Dublin on April 13, 1742. It was to an overcapacity crowd of 700, and it raised 400 pounds and released 142 men from debtor's prison. The demand for tickets was so great that men were asked not to wear their swords and women were asked not to wear hoops in their skirts to allow a hundred more people to come in. So it was a major success. When it went to London, the Hallelujah Chorus began, the Messiah began, then this Hallelujah Chorus part started. The king was in attendance. The Hallelujah Chorus began and King George II stood up And that started a whole tradition 
so that when the hallelujah chorus is played, even to this day, people stand. And there's different ideas about why the king may have stood there, but the one that is the most meaningful, I think, is that it's an acknowledgement that even though he was the king, Christ is the king of kings. And so he stands to acknowledge Christ as the king of kings. So that's what we are going to do. When the Hallelujah Chorus is played after the message today, we are going to stand. We're going to stand to acknowledge that Christ is our king and the king of kings. So as with Handel, our attention is best giving glory to God. He had a lot of operas that he wrote, and they were very big and fancy, very expensive. But then he brought his attention to bringing glory to God, and that's where our attention is best served also. It revived his career, and it is the best way to spend our time. It may not revive our careers, but it is the best way to spend our time. It says in the Bible, seek ye first. Seek ye first. Seek ye first personal happiness, good education, a well-paying job, a love of your life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Our attention is best focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ, giving Him all of the glory and honor and praise. And also like Handel, even when we are in need ourselves, be Christ to others. Be Christ to others. He was about to go into debtor's prison. And he made this benefit concert for people in debtor's prison. And I think that's a perfect example of Christ. Christ, when he came to this world, he was not rich and powerful. He was somebody who experienced all kinds of need as well. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. Even on the cross, he was worried about other people. His mother, for example. He was worried about the women of Jerusalem. And he gave those words to that thief on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. He was still serving people even when he was in need. Even when we are in need. Even when we are hurting. Take time to be Christ to other people. I think that's a wonderful example of what it means to give glory to God. And even in our lowest moments, praise to the Lord. Even in those lowest moments, the worst of times. Hallelujah. A familiar word. It means praise the Lord in Hebrew. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah is sung maybe around 160 times in the Hallelujah Chorus. 160 times, praise the Lord. And Handel wrote that at the lowest point of his life. Praise the Lord, 160 times. Some of you out there might be having a blue Christmas this year. Some of you may have have a lot of difficult things that are weighing on you. Maybe Christmas isn't the most wonderful time of the year for you. I want to encourage you today to still praise the Lord, to still celebrate the coming of this Messiah, because this Messiah means the end of all your trouble and all your pain and all your sorrow. And maybe it's not today, maybe it's not this season, but one day... It will be. And it's because of this Messiah that you can have that hope and that peace and that joy even now that one day all of this will be wiped away. All your tears will be wiped away. And you can have that hope and that joy and that peace now because of this Messiah who's come. Even in your lowest moments, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He is the one who brings deliverance. He even raises the dead. He rewards his servants and he destroys the world's destroyers as it says in our passage today. And as with King George, we need to recognize Christ as our king. We need to recognize him now. One day, 
everyone will recognize him, but we acknowledge him now. He is our king now. He is our Lord now, today. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And to do that, that means more than just standing up for a hallelujah chorus. It means more than that. It means more than posting Bible verses on Facebook. We declare Christ as King by how we live our lives. How do you live your life? Is Christ the King of your life? Do you listen to Him or do you listen to yourself? Do you follow His heart or do you follow yours? We need to acknowledge Him and His authority. We obey speed limits because we recognize the government's authority to impose them. We pay taxes because we recognize government authority. We follow police officer instructions because we recognize their authority. We need to recognize God's authority on our life. We need to follow His instructions. We need to follow His limits. And we need to give Him what He is due. Except one thing that's different about God is that He operates on love, not compulsion. The government operates on compulsion. You must do this. God operates on love and grace. He calls us to follow Him. The cadet verse If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep them. So in each moment of each day, choose to live by his love and grace. Not under compulsion, choose to live by his love and grace. Love your neighbor as yourself. That means even the jerks in your life. Love them even as you love yourself. Submit to authority even the ones that are incompetent. Stand up when people are wronged, even people who are very different than you. They're people too. Stand up for them when they are wronged. Turn from sin. Turn from the sin in your life, even at great cost, even at great sacrifice to you. He is your Lord. He is your King. In a world that resists God's rule, In his reign, live a life that declares hallelujah. Make your whole life be a hallelujah chorus to the Lord, to give him the praise and honor that he deserves. One day the world will acknowledge their true ruler, but let's acknowledge our true ruler now, today, and in our whole lives. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God in heaven, You do marvelous things. And Lord Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And so, Lord, we want to acknowledge you today. We want to give you the honor that you are due, not just in our words, not just by standing up, but, Lord, by living lives that are holy and honorable to you out of your grace and out of your love that you have shown to us. In the name of Jesus, amen.